So far in this course, we've learned about the research methods that typically use large numbers of subjects to try to describe what, you know, how an average person may respond to a given treatment and so on. Another type of research that's done that still falls under the experimental umbrella are single case designs. Uh, while this may seem contrary to be studying one individual or a very small group, uh, because it may be less applicable to the average population, it still can be very valuable because it allows us to explore unique cases, uh, do treatments that maybe are very time consuming and can't be done on large populations. So in this unit, what I want to do is to talk about the concept of single case or small numbers of cases, these types of designs. And they do give a nice kind of uh, ability for researchers to uh, explore how very specific types of treatment programs may help or improve very specific population types. So the goals for this unit are to understand the purpose of single subject designs and its quasi air ex experimental nature. We'll also talk as we look at these designs, the way that samples are selected. And that's often really the key. We want to look at a particular type, very specific type of athlete or person or someone who excels in a specific activity and study them to see what we can learn about how they react and respond to different experimental treatments. We'll also understand how the, uh, what the different types of single subject designs are, because again, they're applied in different ways and allow us to learn different things. They also, these different types of designs are gonna give us more or potentially less ability to say that this study is valid and applicable to a larger population. We'll understand how data is collected in single, single subject designs, how it's analyzed and how it's typically reported. Because again, a lot of what we've talked about thus far in this course has been statistical analysis that utilizes the ideas and concepts of a normal population, large numbers of people, and people always falling around the mean. In single study designs, we don't have large numbers and we aren't people you typically studying people that fall within the mean. We're looking at exceptional or unusual individuals. And then finally, we'll understand the concept of validity and how that impacts single subject designs. When researchers want to examine athletic performance and the limits of human performance, they often use Samples of convenience, uh, subjects that are available to them, which if they're looking at athletes, they'll use uh, athletes from the college that they work at or local colleges or high school athletes or what have you. Often when they do these types of studies, we see that there's a wide range of responses to different types of treatment programs or different types of training programs. So, and you can see this in the literature. When you look at large group studies, you do see some people that respond really well. You also see some people that don't respond real well to particular treatments. And then you see a bunch of people kind of grouped in the middle. And while that type of research can be very useful because it lets us know how the average person responds to a training program, often some of us may be working with not average people. You know, I have a list here of some of my superheroes athletically. And uh, again, these individuals are not average. They do not respond in the normal way uh, that others maybe respond to a training program. You've probably seen this in athletes and people that you've worked with yourself that just can train at a level that's far uh, above other people. They get quicker gains. They really just, again, are, are substantially different from others. This is where single subject research designs can really help us because what they do, it's, it, they allow us to explore and study some of these exceptional or people that are very different from the normal population, the average population, allows us to study them. So again, we're not going to be able to find a bunch of Simone Bileses or uh, you know Michael Phelps to study, uh, but we can find maybe one or two, although for their, those two examples, there's probably not 
two of them. But again, we can find people that fall in these extreme examples. Often too, the, we may not just be looking at people that are extreme performers, but they may have an injury or a condition that we want to study. And again, we can't find a whole bunch of people with those studies. So single subjects research designs allow us to kind of go out and find these exceptional or very unique individuals and study them and still provide some useful information that all of us can use when we're training our athletes or our clients. So the rationale for single subject research designs is it allows the researcher to, uh, again, kind of tease out these uh, unusual performers and study them. And as I said on the previous slide, often research demonstrates large inter-individual differences in response to conditioning programs and other interventions. You know, when you look at some studies, you'll see that some people really improved at to a great extent. So single subject research allows us to maybe pull those people out and study them and figure out why they respond so well when maybe other people do not. So often uh, the studies that we read in the literature look at the average athlete or untrained individuals and look at the effects of these training programs. Single subject research designs allow us to pick a much, much smaller in group of individuals and look at them more closely. That means, again, and I, I said it's called single subject research design, single subject research designs are often performed on a handful of people, not just one. But again, these subjects typically are not similar to the average people. Uh, they are uh, different in some way, but probably are like people that maybe we work with uh, in our population. So again, group studies often can mask the true individual effects uh, on of an intervention on important, relevant individuals. And again, these single subject designs allow us to go out and find those individuals and study them. This type of research is, a, again, a group studies are often problematic when we want to apply them to elite athletes or subjects with unique characteristics. And that's where single subject really excels. Uh, this is from uh, one of the articles in our list here. It shows the differences between single subject designs and group research designs. And what it shows is that single subjects research designs allow us to be much more flexible during the actual implication or application of the treatments and so on. We can change things somewhat. Uh, single subject research designs also allow us to do much more frequent and repeated measurements, which is kind of the hallmark of single subject research design. So we often will see uh, this research or the results presented as a time series, and we can see changes in the subject over time in response to our, our, our intervention and in response to baseline or removal of an intervention. Typically, data analysis is not necessarily done by statistical means in single subjects. It may just be a visual inspection of the data, but there are some statistical methods that can be used, although they aren't the same methods that are used in group research designs. And again, uh, generalization, the ability to say, hey, I expect other people to react to this treatment in the same way is difficult in single subject research designs unless the study is replicated on more and more subjects. Versus in group research designs, we typically use random sampling and therefore the results are gonna be more generalizable to the general or average population. The concept of single subject designs is not new. If anything, it's old, it's kind of, uh, was around before we started to see these larger group type studies with all of this statistical analysis. Really, if you go back to your, uh, you know, maybe intro psychology class, you remember Pavlov and Skinner studied dogs and their responses to uh, different stimuli and so on. Uh, well, those were single subject studies and they did studies on humans as well back in the early 1900s. And typically, these single subject designs involve a very kind of a rigorous observation of one or a few subjects over a period of time with multiple measures of an important dependent variable. So typically, it's some measure of performance or physiological function that will often measure uh, baseline before we put in some type of intervention. 
then we'll put in some type of a training program or intervention and continue to measure the people over the length of the intervention and look at changes in performance or physiological function. This is something that maybe would not be possible if we were looking at 30, 40 people just because of the time it would take to maybe measure these this performance. It also allows us in single subjects design to uh, really make closer determinations if the training is effective and also potentially change or alter the training during the intervention uh, to uh, make it more effective. So again, it allows us to do these, this much more close observation of our subjects and their performance. It also allows for studying the effects on a specific athlete or an athlete type. So you see examples of this often where uh, one athlete is studied and often that athlete is you know, an Olympic champion or a world-class athlete. Uh, you know, and we then look at the way they respond, he or she responds to a treatment program. And uh, again, with an attempt to understand what about them makes them so exceptional. So, so again, this allows for the study of small specific populations of athletes. And in the research, we often see injured groups studied, overtrained athletes studied, or elite athletes, where it may not be possible or feasible to find large groups of people with these conditions or uh, with these characteristics. So single subject designs really can give us a good look at these very specific people and how they respond to specific types of interventions and treatments.